Back to Ghost. All the way across for a check. In front, they score! Patrick tips it home! It's a 4-3 hockey game as the kid seems to be enjoying it on the top power play unit. Three-point game for Patrick. everybody, it's Isaiah with the OMB Pupcast, episode number 30, brought to you by PhillySportsNetwork.com, and I'm here with my partner, uh, Chef B. How are you, my friend? Very good, very good. And of course, courtesy of PhillyIsFlyer.com, Dan the Flyer fan, Dan Ash, how are you, man? I'm doing good, Isaiah. All right. Well... We're here for the Flyers season preview. We're going to have Derek Bob coming on from PSN, PhillySportsNetwork.com. Uh, just uh, directly there, wanted to talk a little bit about the Flyers made some moves today, and we're going to get into that with the cuts. We could still get some late-breaking news about some acquisitions they made, but just some quick housekeeping. The OMB podcast is on five podcast platforms. Also, when we release the show, within about 24 to 36 hours, we're also on the Philly Sports Network YouTube channel. And I just want to thank everybody. Our our listenership just keeps going up. We're going to come out with the best show we can and, and with your help. There's one thing you can do, especially with iTunes, if you have an iOS device, if you could subscribe to the show through that platform and give us a rating, especially a five-star rating. It really is appreciated. There's nothing really more than helps the show besides, of course, your listenership. And with that, gentlemen, it's the, another season. The uh, 2018-19 season is here. Despite whatever minor roster moves we that are going to be made, they're – you know, we we kind of know where they're at right now. If some of these performances hold up, uh, Chef, any initial thoughts about what the off season training camp and uh, the preseason games have informed you? Uh, what has informed me is uh, based on my notes. I went to two games last week. I went to the Monday game and the Thursday game. What it pretty much informed me was that I I, I can't argue with the decision. Uh, they pretty much, in my opinion, made the right decision. Maybe not so much with Latera, but arguably it's that it's that center spot. I mean, they were overloaded on that fourth on the wing, you know, on the fourth line. So I can't really argue with the that too much. I mean, all the extra uh, curricular stuff that's going on with him is is totally different ballpark. And we'll probably talk about that later. But overall, I kind of saw all this coming, so I I can't complain. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, Dan, Brad Keffer from Broad Street Hockey made a pretty astute observation that by releasing Weiss and Lear together on the busiest waiver day of the year, it probably gave them a better chance of sneaking through uh, Lear, who was uh, of the two, is the guy they would want to keep. And I'm sure they wouldn't you know, shed any tears that Dale Weiss was, was actually picked up by a miracle. I mean, I'm sure Dave Haxtell would shed a few tears if Weiss was uh, picked up, but I don't think anybody else would. Yeah, you know, I I don't really uh, know what to make of Lear. I do like the kid, but I don't think he has quite the complete game for the NHL level. He is a good penalty killer, when he sh- uh, which he's shown in the past couple of years, but <clears throat> I don't know. If we're going to see him again this season, he may be one of the call-ups if necessary, if he makes it through. But, uh, you know, I think I'm going to stick to many what Chef said, that I think that nothing is really 
too surprising at the end of the day. Um, you know, obviously Letera is still here, and unless the Finnish uh, police help out with that one, he's probably going to be here for the rest of the season. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's a lot of bright spots, even though this is mainly the same roster. Uh, I think you can rely on guys like Van Riemsdyk to hopefully take a big role, even though he hasn't shown a whole lot thus far in the preseason, uh, to kind of score a few more gold. Uh, Vorobiev has been the huge bright spot early on. And, I mean, this kid, he looks like a star. He really, really does look good. I always warn that these are practice games. But one of the aspects of Vorobiev that we liked, even from day one, when you watched him last year, when you, you wanted a little more from him, his details and his uh, natural hockey IQ really come through. And it's just even more writ large with his play this uh, exhibition season. He's just on the right side of the puck. He's setting things up. He's more assertive. And it's interesting, Shep, that they, it looks like there's a possibility him and JVR could be on a line with Simmons where they switch up and put Lindblom with Patrick because JVR, Patrick, and Jake weren't really showing chemistry you know these things change in one period still that says a lot about how they feel about Verovia well when I was watching him I got to I get two good up close looks at him and whereas you know who they sent down Myers and Hart I pretty much are two Friedman probably later than more later than sooner that could make an appearance but more so uh where, where Vorby is the thing about him is when he made his mistakes on ice, and there were two in, in, in the Thursday game, a turnover and, a, and a, I think he just made an errant pass or something, he back-checked and hustled his butt off and, and got and redeemed himself on those plays, whereas maybe he's in, you know, the other players that were vying for these spots at that time, the, the, the crucial spots at the end of the, you know, uh, the preseason there, they did. You know, it's not that they didn't hustle, but they didn't get to those spots where he did, and it showed he had like a huge dunk, a jump in in those two games that I saw in person. So, yeah, that that's important, especially for the development uh, of him to see him come out like so like hardcore like that. Yeah, he's extremely conscientious, and it shows up in his play, and that's exactly what you want from a third line center. You know, gentlemen, we have to remember, third line center was like the big hole in the lineup. And all of a sudden, if Vorobiev can, you know, can be a 30-point player is on the positive side of the puck, I mean, that's really a big upgrade that people, I think, are underestimating. Dan, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think he filled that hole perfectly. I think he's shown uh, both – a good defensive side and the ability to chip in some offense during the preseason. And, you know, he's obviously, I think no matter who he plays with on that third line, whether it's Lindblom, JVR, Voracek, Simmons, whoever, you know, he's going to be with some elite company. So he should have more than a good opportunity to really uh, show what he's worth early here and uh, make him stay in that third line as the season goes on. Yeah. Uh, One other thing, I don't think we're necessarily stuck with the Finnish drug Lord, Yuri Montana. I think that, no, as we call that Yuri Laterra, you know, I think Corbin Knight was ticketed for that spot. And he got hurt at a really bad time for the Flyers and seems like even worse for the fans, really. But I I would not be surprised if he was uh, let go when Corbin Knight is given an opportunity. It, It just depends on the nature of Corbin Knight's injury. It would seem like when he's ready to play, he's ready to play. He probably won't need like a conditioning assignment, like a goaltender with a groin problem like Lyon. He can't come right up anyway. He he has to get in shape and make sure he has that kind of injury. Now, Corbin Knight, if I think it's an upper body, a shoulder or something like that. When he's ready to come back, I mean, the terror could be pushed out. Dan? Uh, he, yeah, he you know, I... I, I do think I could see it. He obviously, uh, Corbin Knight played under Dave Haxtell, so there is that connection immediately that could give him that extra bit of favoritism if need be. But, you know, he definitely seemed to be earning Haxtell's trust during the preseason. Um, you know, especially if Latera comes out and plays the way he usually does, it shouldn't be hard for 
uh, Corbin Knight to at least get a chance at that fourth line center, and hopefully he overtakes him, and uh, that'll end the Finnish drug lord's uh, chances. Yeah, yeah. And, and Chef, I think that's really uh, – that would make people – happy but more importantly Knight does bring a little bit more in terms of speed I'm not going to say he's quite as smart a player as Laterra but Laterra is just so ungodly slow <laughs> didn't didn't I see him do a little bit of PK duty too he was up I thought I saw him up there on it was either Monday or Thursday I, I got my notes mixed up but who re, who so, re, re, uh, uh Knight Knight Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, and I think we expressly, I think it was Dan that brought it up like, not, uh, wow, even before the season started that if you're going to crack this team, like that could be one of the spots where you, you, you search a hole, you, you find your value and being that PK killer, especially in this atrocious, you know, how, how often it's been in the, in the, in the last couple of years that if you can get your foot in the door and make yourself valuable. And that's why some of those players were still there because you can't play the big guys on PK power play and full lines. Exactly. You don't want to tire these guys. Ad. I mean, the notion that role players is, is something that uh, is old school is just divorced from the reality of the, of the salary cap and the long grind of the season. It, it's good to have players who you can trust with hard minutes so you can spare your best players the grind when you really need them and in April and beyond. But, yeah, I, I think that Knight is a good all-around AHL player who translates into a guy who could play fourth line. He's he'll kill penalties down there. I don't want to overstate what he is. Well, most teams, he's a 12th or 13th forward. That's fine. It's Laterra as a particular irritant along with Weiss. So as fans, we want to move on. In the grand scheme of things, is it a, really that big a deal? Nah, not really. But you, you wouldn't know that by <laughs> judging by Flyers Twitter. So it, we're going to get in Derek's feeling on that. Uh, just one last thing. Uh, speaking of uh, Derek, he, he wrote an article, Scott Hartnell retired. Uh, it seemed inevitable if he hadn't been picked up by now. He was at that point in his career. Dan, uh, what's your memories of Scott Hartnell as a flyer and beyond? You know, I really remember him in the playoffs, you know, uh, against the Penguins in uh, 2012. You know, probably my favorite uh, string of Flyers games uh, of all time would be that series. And, uh, you know, he was always kind of that player that was fun. And he was uh, a big producer back in the day during his peak. Yeah, no question. And it just so happens the author of that article, making his first appearance on the OMB podcast from phillysportsnetwork.com, we want to welcome Dirk Bob. Dirk, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, ready to get the ball rolling here. Cool. We, we were just reflecting on uh, Scott Hartnell. You Obviously, you wrote an article today for PSN, and just maybe just an, a quick overview of that article, and maybe some personal reflections. Yeah, I mean, when you look at it, Scott Hartnell was a big part of the Flyers for years. After coming over from Nashville, he became quickly became a fan favorite due to a lot of the actions mentioned in that article. I mean, who doesn't like a guy trying to break up a, a breakaway with throwing his you know glove in the way? <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, I think what really endeared him to the Philly fan base was the fact that he just had this ridiculous amount of charisma and just he was a goofball and people loved that. And he was passionate. He stuck up for his teammate. That's the Philly way right there. And, I mean, it, it all kind of culminated with that 2012 end of the regular season, beginning of the postseason against the Penguins. I mean, that just his actions through there and – I mean, that was kind of if, – if you didn't love Scott Hartnell before then, you definitely loved him then. Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he annoyed me a lot with some of those cross-ice passes, the way he would fall down, you know, Hartnell down and all that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, he, were, he did wear his heart on, on his sleeve. And you're right. I mean, we, we are naturally attached to players like that who, ha who bring a little talent. I mean, let's not forget that year. I think he went 37 goals that year. Oh, 67 points, I believe. I'm looking through notes right now. I thought I had that written down, but 
I believe yeah, it was but, somewhere in the 60 range, yeah. Yeah, and then 30, I, I remember the 37 goals, and there was, you know, Braden Shen took over for that high slot on the power play, but he scored quite a few of those goals, and he was really the first guy after Knubel to, to really uh, take over from that high slot in that different era after we moved on from Richards and Carter. And, Chef, you know, one thing I think of uh, with Scott Hartnell, along with Timo, he were those were the two guys that signaled after 07 that the Flyers weren't going to score around. Holmgren took over, paid a first-round draft pick, and brought those two guys in as free agents and signed them. And you knew the Flyers were going to be an exponentially better team than that team that finished last in probably the most disastrous season in team history. Yeah, I mean, we saw <laughs> – of all of, you know, almost a total opposite of what Hexy does, you know, Homer wasn't afraid to go out and spend money. Now, you know, later on, his choices were on, made, might have been unwise and he gave out bad contracts, but nobody could be, uh, you couldn't accuse him of not being ready to spend the money. So, yeah, in that sense, yes, you know, there was a, a little bit of a change after that. But uh, did it last? Did it last, or or was it the right moves? I should say. It's not that it didn't last long enough. It was. The, it was. It might not have been the right moves. No, but I mean, yeah, we all know Homer turned out to be a drunken sailor at the very end. But <laughs> and I mean, I think the thing the thing was was that Hartnell was part of the new recruits that took the Flyers co- completely out of the doldrums. If you combine that those signings with Briere. And then the way Mike Richards emerged, 08 was really a, a, a fun year. But so it, we move on from Scott Hartnell and uh, Dan. Uh, we're just going to dig a little deeper with Derek about what the lineup is going to look like. Uh, but one last thing a lot of fans were upset that Philippe Myers didn't make it. He was sent down and then brought back up when the Flyers didn't want to dress their top pair in the final preseason game. And he struggled a little, a little bit. But any last thoughts on Phil Myers and his demotion? You know, I'm not super surprised that he got sent down even from the beginning. But, you know, he just – we talk about the speed of the game changing at the NHL, and I think that's his biggest uh, bugaboo at the moment because he just, he gets the puck, and no matter where he is, it's the – uh, Brandon Manning syndrome. He gets the puck and chucks it on net wherever he is without really thinking about it. And he had quite a few shots on point blocked and he just, he looked a little panicked out there. So I think sending him down, telling him to calm down, you know, think about his game before he just makes errant passes. Uh, you know, he's probably sent down with specific things to work on. And uh, hopefully we see him again at some point in this year, if the injuries pile up, but I think in the long run, he's probably going to be okay. But for right now, it's the best move to send him down. I, I could not agree more. When you see those passes to nowhere, then you know a guy's just trying to get rid of the puck like it's a hot potato, and you, you just can't do that in today's game, especially with the speed. And, of course, we all think about the one that went in back of the net, but that's not really representative of the problems he had. But he's, he's not that far away. And, Derek, let's uh, turn toward what actually went down over the last uh, 24 hours or so We kind of commented before you came on about uh, Weiss and Lear being, uh, you know, waived. And I just wanted to get your thoughts about the strategy here. Are the Flyers looking to maybe make a trade or bring somebody else in? What's your thoughts? I saw earlier today, or it might have been yesterday, it was either Meltzer or Isaac said that there was no intention of Hexball making a deal. Um, I, you know, obviously take that with a grain of salt. But, you know, you think of the guys that they waived between Weiss and Lear, what, what are you going to get for a guy like Dale Weiss? You know, um, if anything, Lear would be the only guy that would be really worth anything. And in the, at that point, you're getting, what, a fifth, sixth, seventh rounder. Obviously, we all know that Hextall covets those late-round picks. But, you know, is it worth giving up a decent depth forward that can obviously play over a guy like Weiss and Latera? Um, I'm at least somewhat I'm trying to be encouraged by that one play Latera had where he just showed a burst of speed that nobody thought he ever had and fed Raffle on that shorthand attempt. So if he can at least exemplify that moving forward, great. I Hopefully we can get more out of him this year than we have before. But 
it's kind of puzzling because I think a lot of people thought Lear was going to be the guy um, to be part of that team moving forward, but I guess they're putting their faith in Latera, which, you know, kind of doesn't surprise me, I should say, but it is what it is. And then we mentioned before we came on, don't count out Corbin Knight just yet. I still think eventually he'll be ticketed for, for that spot, especially if that little burst of speed by uh, Latera was actually – because he had leftover stash from the cottage, you know what I'm saying? But <laughs> I think that's a fluke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, all right, that's the last snow joke we have here. Uh, just <laughs> with that, I just wanted to mention some local writers wrote about the talent versus younger talent versus veteran, uh, you know, stability from the standpoint of coaches. And they were talking about, I think Phil Myers was the target. Just my commentary here. Everything that you you think about has to be in the context of a player's development and the timeline of the team. And that's why, going back to Myers for a second, I just don't see the upside. We know that Phil Myers is more talent than, than Robert Haig or AMAC. But the fact of the matter is you don't want to look back, possibly lower developmental ceiling, of a player like Myers because just because you're impatient, there's just not enough good reason. So he could be 30, 40 games away and this conversation won't amount to much. But with that, uh, chef, I want to turn to the forward lines. Do you have an idea of what you envision? If you want to go by the latest practice lines or what have you, what they're going to look like uh, when we come out in Vegas on Thursday night? Well, if it was me, I wouldn't. I wouldn't, as of yet, touch the top line. You only seen one game with with, with Coote, so, and I know he looked like a little. He's just getting his legs back, so. But I still wouldn't touch that. I think Giroux, TK, and uh, Coots is fine. Uh, second line, I've, you know, you had mentioned already about maybe mixing that up already, but I, I still think, I don't know. Maybe I'm just. Uh, I, I see it everywhere. I think it should be. JVR, Patrick, and, and Jake. I think they're just more complimentary with each other. And then that, you know, third line, you know, if, if you know, uh, Warby, yeah, that'd be great uh, with Oscar and, uh, you know, Simmer. So I'm I'm fine with all that. Yeah, and the fourth line is just a grab bag. It, I'm not, we're not sure if uh, Lawton or Laterra, it would look like it would be Laterra at this point with Lawton on yeah. the wing. And but, it's just that. But really, that, yeah, go ahead. Are they, aren't they short, like at least one roster spot right now, too? And maybe yeah, but two, nobody, not, I, it, not, it doesn't affect the lineup. I mean, Wheel could play yeah. right wing. Yeah, no, I'm just saying I, 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 there's at least one roster spot. And I think Hexie's quoted saying uh, he wants to, he wants to carry at least one extra forward out there just to make the trip. So. Oh, we, yeah, uh, there'll definitely be it, it but I, I, I don't thing, know so. necessarily if it's going to affect the fourth line because I think you would look at Laterra, Lawton, and Wheel. Uh, Dan, uh, what, what's your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think it's probably going to be uh, Law, uh, Lawton and Laterra, probably Laterra centering, and that wing spot is interesting. It could be Raffle or Wheel. Oh, that's uh, right, per- Raffle, right. I forgot about mm-hmm. him. Yeah, I, I had – trust me, I wrote all lines down earlier, so I wouldn't forget anybody. We got uh, Raffle. I think Raffle is probably the better player over Wheel. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, again, I don't know what Hack wants from that line. You know, he does seem to not trust Jordan Wheel a whole lot. Um, so it could be uh, Latera, Lawton, and Raffle, which I still think is a pretty solid fourth line, all things considered. Lawton is really good, and Raffle's really good, so hopefully they can uh, make up for Latera. Yeah, I, I would think so. At, out of all the remaining choices, uh, I would think Raffle by far would be the best choice. And if, if Latera stinks, you always have wheel to go out there. Uh, Derek, let's turn to the uh, defense, unless you have some different thoughts about the lines. Um, Forward lines, honestly, I think Raffle is your lock on the fourth line, no matter what. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should definitely stay there. And I think – Lawton's your lock on the wing, and like you said, I think Latera and Wheel are a little interchangeable. It just depends on on a night in, night out basis. Do you want speed or do you want Latera? <laughs> um, <laughs> right. uh, and Wheel, but, Wheel was killing it too in the preseason game. He was everywhere. 
Mm-hmm. Wheel's a fast guy. I mean, he's he's the kind of guy you can put out there that can chase down the puck. But you know, with that, there's caveats to his game as well that you know aren't the greatest. So it's you know it's just kind of a night in night out basis. See what you're feeling. See who's hot. You know, whatever it may be. Um, but as far as defense goes, obviously we know who the first pairing is going to be. Um, Pro Robin Gossas Bear. That that's not changing at all this season. I don't believe so. At least uh, second pairing. I've got down Sanheim and McDonald, and I'm reluctant to do that because that puts the third pairing at Gudis and Hay. That third pairing isn't the greatest. Uh, it, it, the way they both played last year, Hay, his only somewhat redeeming quality is the fact that he's a tough guy and he can hit, and those hits can sometimes swing momentum a little bit. But, you know, that only really – that's a small part of the game, a very small part of the game. But, you know, are you going to risk splitting up Sanheim and McDonald, who actually played decent together? Uh, you know, who are you going to put with McDonald that's going to try to bring out the best in his game aside from Provorov? And like I said before, you're not uh, toppling that first defensive pairing. So that's kind of what it looks like for me. Um, unless I don't see Fulwin uh, cracking the lineup unless there's an injury, obviously. But maybe him and Haig are going to be interchangeable. Who knows? And then if there's an injury, Myers, I guess, would be the first call up. Unless later in the season, if Morin comes back and he's healthy, I would like to at least see him get some NHL time and see what he can do. Sure. No, I no, I can I can definitely see that. I might want to have Sanheim with Gudis. They actually had some good moments. It's just you know McDonald has I think a better ability to adapt than. Gudis, if the if the partner is not optimal, I'll put it that way, that would probably be the only change. And I do think there's a possibility if Phil Myers does make it here, that could throw a really a positive dynamic in the into the scenario. But right now, of course, that's not happening. Uh, Dan, any final thoughts uh, about the defense? And we're going to talk about the goaltending. You know, I had I had a uh, Sandheim with Gudis and then Hag and Emac, and uh, you know, at some point you're just gotta accept one of those pairs is gonna be terrible no matter who you mix, because Sandheim can only carry one of them. But you know, but at the end of the day, I think Foline is probably gonna pull a Terra, and he's, I think he's gonna sit for the first twenty or so games and then get put into the lineup because somebody's gonna be dumb. Um, Somebody's going to be down, and they're going to put uh, Fallen in, and he's probably going to stick around simply because he's a righty. Uh, so they, so he has that kind of excuse to uh, to pop in the lineup. So hopefully uh, that doesn't take Sanheim out of the equation because we all know Hack doesn't like uppity defensemen. So hopefully that stays the same. But you know, I, I think that as long as Provi and Ghost can stay healthy, the Flyers' defense should at least be semi-respectable. Yeah, I think that we uh, just. Like you said, we have to accept that some of the pairs are going to be less than desirable. As long as they're regular season passable, we'll come to the playoff season and maybe they'll add a guy or maybe Myers will be up there by then and we'll go from there. Uh, Chef, uh, let's talk about the goaltending and I'm going to get on my high horse. Look, they have an extra spot. I am a big believer that the Flyers should add a goaltender and the rationale is real simple. They have Elliott coming off of two surgeries. And who knows that that second surgery really wasn't because he screwed up the first operation by coming back too soon. That's number one. Then we have Stolarz. Stolarz played 40 games the last two years, including only four, four games last year, all last year. Then we have Lyon, who is the backup plan. And he's hurt. He has, according to Sam Dinellon, a groin injury. And we know when we rush back from those, as they tend to do, then we know how that can work out. Then we have somebody, uh, Nuvi, who should they should have let go in the offseason. He's always hurt. I know he's with them in Vegas. He's skating till he gets hurt again. And then, of course, we have Carter Hart. And we don't want to do, do that. I think for 20 or 30 games, until the situation gets sorted out, Take a less than $1 billion insurance policy and Curtis McElhaney, who for the last two seasons has been right around 920 in very limited action behind not such a great defense. 
So that's how I feel about it. I feel there's a very great likelihood the Flyers are going to have more injuries on goal, and I'd rather have a stabilizer than have a quick panic call to Carter Hart, and he, and we're off to the races screwing up that position for the future. Uh, <laughs> Chef, I, I'm, I'm done. I'm off my soapbox. <laughs> No, no, you're 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 not. You get back on because you you were doing good there. <laughs> I think I think you're 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 not far off base. I think the, the it still isn't. You know, it's, it's amazing that if you looked at we got like what six. You just mentioned six goalies, five six goalies in like a fifteen second span, and it's still not enough for us. Well, uh, that's how long they're going to last yeah. on the ice. Yeah, I know. So. Uh, I'm a, I'm a big uh, put on get get what you can out there, and I, I think I would even go a million and a half if I had to, maybe even two, just because I I don't want to I, I don't want to you know go to that whole route where you're pulling up Carhartt and, and the fans you know the fans are going to pull for it they're going to call for it they're going to call for it as soon as it's uh, two bad losses and 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 an injury you put those two together and that's just the perfect recipe to go get Carter up here. And it's it's probably not the wisest choice. I know there's certainly some players that have fought through that over the years, but you you know well, one of them being I think Price came up when he was in his 20s, early 20s. But I mean, he wasn't that good for the first couple of years, and it kind of like pushed back of his, his development. So I would be very cautious. I, I would go out there to maybe sign, or if you can get anybody. At this point, just like you said, an insurance policy just to keep on uh, keep hanging around. Well, McElhaney got waived. He's eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So if you claimed him, that would be what it would cost you. And I just want to add something else. I was listening to Off the Post podcast, yeah. and it had uh, Kat Silverman, who's a goaltender, and she covers the Arizona uh, Coyotes for the Athletic, and she studies goaltenders, writes about them, was one herself. Like I said. She was talking about Carter Hart and his style and how it's different from somebody like Thatcher Demko. She says there's no good reason to lower the developmental ceiling of a a goaltender like Hart because the way he plays, where it's very systematic, he doesn't rely so much on athleticism as much as somebody like Demko, like I mentioned, but he has to get used to the different passing sequences the quickness with which these other shooters at higher levels are going to get rid of the puck, the different angles. She said, you'll be rewarded in the long term because of how quiet he is in net, but he has to adjust his style at a lower level. And you want that process to go on as long as it takes, because this is a 30 year problem. The Flyers have had Derek. uh, What are your thoughts? I agree. Um, I will admit that at first I was kind of on board with the whole let's get Carter Hart to the NHL train. Obviously, that's impatient me. But thinking about it now, you're not going to go past New Neuvers. You're not going to go past Elliott. They're going to be your starting goalies because for some reason there's this undying loyalty to them. Elliott, if he's healthy and part of a timeshare, you've seen with uh, Halak when he was in St. Louis, when he's part of a timeshare, Elliott is most effective. So if you can get a decent goalie there with him to split time, that's where he's going to win those games for you, and he's going to put up those good numbers. Bringing in a guy, like you said, Isaiah, uh, McElhenney, I think that might be the best move right now because you can't you can't depend on Neubert. He's going to get hurt. He's, he's going to come back from getting hurt, and then he's going to get hurt again. You've got a guy like Stolarz who you really don't know what you've got in him because he, it's such a small sample size. He was great when he was with the NHL. I think it was a .928 save percentage. He, he stops pucks. He's good. He's big. But, you know, two major knee surgeries in a matter of two or three years, that's debilitating sometimes. And, you know, that could change up the way he plays all around. So you don't know what you're getting. Lion, what he lacks in speed from post to post, he makes up for with those last this desperation moves, but you can't count on that. You want a guy that's technically sound. Yes. Um, so, like you said, I agree. I think that bringing in a guy like Michael Henney would be the best option, especially at a price tag of 850k. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You send him down on waivers when someone's healthy and someone picks him up. Oh no, there goes 850k. You know, it's it obviously tough. That's a big deal, but you know, to it's chump change. Like, it's chump yeah, change. It's chump change to him. Exactly. 
Yeah, that that's that, that's uh, that's where we're at right now, and I, this this is why I'm I'm such an urgency addict about this goaltending situation. If you get buried right out of the gate, and it's you turn around before you know it, it's December first. Mathematically, Dan, your odds of making the playoffs are practically minuscule. I know they did it a couple of years ago, but you don't want to play with fire like that. No, you know, it's always you always get these important games and the Flyers generally don't come out of the gate uh, too hot. But, you know, it, they got to start winning some games early and it does come down to the goaltending. Essentially, this goaltending is a disaster no matter how you cut it. And the season's going to start. Uh, pretty rocky. They play Vegas, Colorado, San Jose, uh, Vegas again, uh, Columbus, New Jersey, Colorado. But they, they play some stuff, uh, stiff competition early on here. So I don't know if getting a goalie is the best move. Personally, I think they left that. Uh, they're going to leave that uh, extra roster spot open for New Earth when he comes back, and they're going to carry three goalies, uh, which would be Stolarz, Elliott, and New Earth. But, you know, it is only a matter of time before – uh, one or more of them get hurt, given all three of them have uh, track records of injuries. So I don't know now what they're going to do here, but they really painted themselves into a corner that I don't know if there's a way to get out of. It's like going into a swimming pool with a regular Band-Aid. You know it's going to fall off, but you're in denial. Uh, all right. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's how I feel about it. I don't want to belabor the point. I probably already have. Let's talk about these specialty units because uh, it'll put me in a better mood. Uh, Derek, I want to go back to you, and then Chef will, will will pick up on the PK. The power play units, nobody really has an idea of what they're going to open up with when they're in Las Vegas against Golden Knights. And that is very interesting. They have a little bit of a positive conundrum, if you will, about who how to mix and match these two units. Either way, though, they should be potent for the first time in a long time with two power play units. I think you're right. I think that with adding a guy like JVR, that makes you that much deeper, especially on the power play, because now you've got um, you've got Couturier and Giroux, and I'm assuming Konechny. I think that would probably be the best fit because they're already line mates on the first line. If not Konechny, I could see them adding a guy like Borchek instead. But then you've got JVR there, who's your net front presence, um, you know. And then with Gostisbehere quarterbacking that first unit. I think that that first unit alone, obviously, I mean, look at the players on there. Giroux's coming off a 100-point season. Couturier just had 70-something points. TK just doubled his point production, essentially, from first year to second. And Goss Bear is one of the best offensive defensemen in the league. I'll go and say that. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. You know, and then you go to the second power play unit. You've got guys, you know, if not Borchek, you've got a guy like uh, Lindblom, who could play in front of the net. He's good around the boards. He can win those battles along the boards. Um, Nolan Patrick, obviously, is going to center that line. And then you've got, you know, uh, Wayne Simmons, who could sit in front of the net. You've got, I mean, look at, if Konechny's not on the first line, put him on the second line there. I And honestly, I would kind of like to see what Sanheim could do, quarterback in that. I think that he's got the offensive upside to potentially – He's not going to be a gas despair, you know, don't get me wrong, but I think that he could be a solid contributor on that power play two unit. Yeah, it's just decision is dress an extra forward or go with two defensemen with Provorov and Sandheim. And I think Sandheim really, he's going to take a big bump up if he gets the kind of ice time we expect. And you're going to see some real uh, offensive imagination and ingenuity with uh, Travis Sandheim, because that's really the strength of his game, finding players where a lot of other defensemen just simply can't make those those types of passes. Oh, absolutely. His vision's great. Yeah, that, it's definitely a strength. So it, it'll be very interesting to see how these units are put together. And, of course, what we see on Thursday night is not necessarily how it's going to play out the rest of the year. They're going to experiment with it. Hopefully they'll do a lot more stuff at least on one of the units, but coming from behind the net, I think that's a little bit more of a new wave instead of trying to do everything east-west, a little bit more uh, attacking and, and getting players emerging into the slot and trying to move things around quickly. But, uh, Chef, looking at the PK units in this roster, you'd think, like, uh, guy. this is why I think Leterre is here 
and why he's probably going to get the lion's share of time, at least until night comes back, because they're going to need as many penalty killers as you know they can. And they're, like we talked about last week on last on the last show, they're going to be experimenting with new systems and trying to find that balance between being too uh, too aggressive like they were at the start of the year and obviously uh, being too passive uh, toward the end of last year into the playoffs. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm sure sure it, it, hurt, it hurt him when Knight got hurt. So, But uh, the, the one positive they can take from it, the PK got better during the preseason at least. Uh, I think they killed, what, four or five on Saturday and actually scored short and a goal a couple of times during the preseason. So, there's there's at least positives to take away from it, and I I totally agree with you with the simple fact that you know, Latera is here because he, he does an adequate job on the penalty kill, and I think if there was a choice, you know, it came down to be him and Weiss or even Lear, uh, I think it came down to you take the guy who's got this experiment, the experience and knows the system, and I think that's just how the, the cookie crumbled in that in that particular case. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely see the experimentation based on possible uh, personnel changes that could be coming up as quickly as the next 24 hours. Gentlemen, uh, the time is going by quickly for this segment, but uh, I did wanted to uh, hit uh, Dan up. Is the one thing, because I know you're not a Hackstall fan, is the one big area that you <laughs> want him to improve and the coaching staff perhaps in general? You know, I just think it comes down to player usage. The same thing that I've been preaching for three years now is just his. Just he just seems to lack the killer instinct that I think a, a coach that could really carry a team deep into a playoff needs. He, it's the the playing Lateras in the last two minutes of a game when they're up one goal and they need it. You know, you just and a granted, this the roster still is not. I think the best that it could be, especially the uh, defense. But, you know, his fascination with guys like Laterra and Amac and, and uh, Gudis, you know, he, I great. you can't rely on guys like Provorov for 45 minutes a night, unfortunately. But, you know, hopefully in time, you know, and this is kind of hoping, uh, kind of what I was hoping this season would kind of do, would bring some of the kids in and, and uh, erase some of the bigger mistake players in the roster. But, you know, I'm, ho- hopefully – he kind of learns, and we get to see guys like Vorobiev take a big step forward so he doesn't have to rely on Laterra as much. But, you know, I hope that he can figure it out. But if he can't, I mean, this is his fourth year. It's time to it's time, time to start put up or shut up, and uh, hopefully he can uh, put up. Yeah, I, I you know, I think Vorobiev really is like a, 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 a turnkey kind of player for Dave Haxtell. Moving away – from the reliance on the veteran presence kind of players. When you have smart, younger players like Couturier, obviously Giroux, and now Vorobiev in that mold, you're starting to, they're going to start moving away in some critical minutes. If these guys can come out of the gate and pass muster, and I think that's something that, you know, I think we're going to see an improvement with Haxtell, but he's got, the guys have to deliver. You just can't go and say the practice games mean that that's what's going to happen during the season. But uh, Dirk, we got you allotted for a certain amount of time here. And that time is coming to a close. We just want to get your overall feeling about the team and maybe give us uh, your prediction for what the Flyers are going to do this year. I mean, I'm optimistic. I, I'd like to be optimistic just because of the way that this off season did go. The Flyers made a good move in signing JVR. That's a sign that they're willing to at least take one step forward. The next step was, like you said before, implementing Vorobiev into the roster instead of keeping a guy like Weiss or signing somebody else out there. So, the right steps are being taken, and I think that through the year, as injuries happen, there's going to be younger kids stepping up, and if they make an impression, and they might end up forcing somebody out of a roster spot because they're playing better. I think the signs are there, and I think that this is a team that could finish in the top three in the Metro. I, I definitely think it's 
within reason that if they did, they could potentially win their first playoff series in how many years now? That's the optimist in me. But the realist is kind of saying that I, you know, it could be another year like last year where we make it to the first round but end up running into a hot team like Pittsburgh uh, and we get beaten six games. I do think, though, that this year they're going to find a way to put this all together. And I think that this could be the year they finally take it to the second round of the playoffs. Um, and that's, you know, I'm hoping at least. I could see maybe, you know, another 99 to 100 point season. I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's that. Now we appreciate that. That, that given given us your thoughts, and we're going to hold off until the very end of the show because we want to keep the suspense going. You know, you got to you got to tease that uh, a little bit. But uh, Derek, yeah, it's been so great to have you on. Of course, you're at phillysportsnetwork.com. At where can yes, people sir. find you on Twitter? Twitter, you can find me at puckbobpsn. Uh, two B's in last name. It's a weird one, I know. But um, actually, three B's, if you count it. It's B-O-B-B. I blame my parents for that one. <laughs> well, you can be part of the uh, uh, Better Business Bureau when when you retire, you know. That's so, true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we just want to – yeah. Thanks so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. And we'll definitely have you back uh, down the road. Of course, guys. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, and I uh, can't wait for more episodes, man. Fantastic. Uh, Derek, thanks again. Yep, thank you. Take care. And with that, we like would like to welcome our uh, second guest uh, tonight, a returning guest from the fourth period.com, giving us kind of like the national global perspective. Anthony DeMarco. Anthony, welcome back. Hey, guys. How's it going? Glad to be back. Uh, great, great. Uh, we've been talking about specifically breaking down the Flyers, their forward lines, penalty kill, coaching, and all that. Just wanted to get your general impression of what the Flyers did today and have done with their cuts and what you think it portends for the future. Well, I, I think that the cuts today just indicate that the Flyers want to win now. Uh, just the cut of Dale Weiss in years past, you probably would not have seen that. And uh, Taylor Lear, a guy who he has just been beat out by younger guys, Verobia uh, in particular. The, their forwards, to me, are if everyone plays up to their capabilities, are as good as almost anyone in the Eastern Conference, uh, right down to the third line where you have Simmons and Vorobiev, and then whether or not it's Limblom or Van Riemsdyk. And I think that at the end of the day, it just comes down to the defense and uh, the goaltending, that, like in years past, that will be the question marks. But uh, I really like how they're shaping up here, and I think – the biggest thing is that in difference from years past, you can tell that the Flyers are actually planning on winning this year. Yeah, I, 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 I can definitely agree with that. There's no doubt that the JVR move, the willingness to let Vorobiev uh, take the role and run with it at such an important position. You know, Anthony, we, we were talking about one thing I think has really been kind of lost in all the excitement about uh, Misha being on the team is that what, a big deal it was going into the training camp. What are they going to do at, at third line center? Wheel and Lawton were kind of just okay. Now we're really excited about the prospects of not only what he can do, but now it feels like we have three scoring lines that have that can have a two way presence as well. Not just guys that are going to play one side of the puck. Well, yeah, exactly. Like last year, for instance, like it was so well documented how much that Simmons struggled. And of course, a lot of that pertained to all of his injuries. But he was also riding shotgun with Valtteri Filpula for the majority of last season and or, and or Jordan Wheel. And those guys really weren't able to drive any offensive play. And I think that now that they have a guy like Vorobiev and adding someone like Van Riemsdyk, it just kind of like places everyone out, uh, out better because Limblom is now going to be on a third line as opposed to when he jumped right in on the second line. Jordan Wheel and Valtteri Filtula aren't even in the opening night, um, opening night roster. 
if I'm not mistaken, unless Wheel slots in for uh, Laterra. But nevertheless, he won't be in the top nine. And I just think Vorobiev will bring another breath of fresh air in terms of youth and energy and just that hunger that a guy like, let's say, Filpula, who was almost in the twilight of his career, or even Dale Weiss, who started in the top nine last year, don't have that drive as a guy like Vorobiev. So I, I just think an insertion of a guy who can play the game at a quick pace, drive offensive play while being defensive and help out a guy like Wayne Simmons who didn't have that kind of help last year is quite essential. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 I'm really looking forward to it. I hope he can push through and be mostly what we saw uh, during the preseason games. But uh, gentlemen, let's move forward. Let's take a look around the league. And uh, Anthony, I'm going to start with you being our guest don't worry, uh, uh, Chef and Dan, we'll get to you. But Anthony did write an article about the Pacific Division for the fourth period dot com. And I did want to do a, a preview of what's going on around the league and just the general impressions about what the trends are. We're not going to go through every little nook and cranny because really, I don't know if we have the audience that wants to hear that. But I think it, we're looking for an overview of, of the different uh, divisions. Well, I was just finishing one up on the Atlantic division tonight. I plan to get all four done. But I think that you can kind of see that the titans of the NHL were kind of trying to outdo themselves dating back to last year's trade deadline. Last year's trade deadline, the Tampa Bay Lightning made that big splash when they got McDonough. Then they kind of dominoed into the Los Angeles Kings, adding Ilya Kovalchuk. And then... Then he moved on to the Leafs, adding John Tavares. And the common trend in all this were the San Jose Sharks, who struck out on Kovalchuk. They were devastated on striking out on Tavares. And then they go out and land Eric Carlson, which is arguably the best defense in the NHL. Then you get um, the, the Vegas Golden Knights, who go out and land Paul Stash in free agency, grab Max Pacioretty. So I, I think the trend here is that the big titans are not being content with the status quo. And in my piece uh, about the Pacific Division, you know, like Los, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights and the Sharks, like those are two mega pieces that each of them added. And then you get the Los Angeles Kings who added Ilya Kovalchuk, then the Calgary Flames who they brought in uh, Noah Hannison and Elias Lindholm. It's basically a trend that like if you're not ready to keep pace with the guys above you, you're going to be left in the dust because everyone's kind of outdo themselves. Yeah, yeah, I don't think there's any, any doubt about that. And, you know, Dan, I, just looking at Anaheim, uh, they're in a tough spot, but missing uh, Corey Perry, and they're not sure. Well, anybody know the deal with Kessler? Yeah. What, yeah, he's hurt to start the year. Right. I mean, this is a team that had Stanley Cup aspirations this time last year, and they're in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, the Ducks, you know, they're kind of starting to uh, – I think their uh, Stanley Cup window is starting to close, and the injuries to two of their key forwards certainly doesn't help. You know, their defense uh, is is not what it was a couple seasons ago when they were really at the peak. You know, they got rid of Sammy Vatten, and, you know, they still have John Gibson. Uh, hopefully, you know, he can carry that team out west. But, you know, I think they're, I, I they're going to be in some trouble. I think there's a very stacked uh, Western Conference right now, and – you know, with teams like Vegas and San Jose uh, stacking up, you got Calgary out there in LA as well. Like, uh, like Anthony just said, they got a lot to worry about. And I'm not sure that uh, if those injuries are long term, but if they are, you know, they could be uh, could be in quite the hole by the time the playoffs roll around. Yeah, and that's the thing I mentioned earlier. If you get in a hole by December first, you're in a bad spot. It's really tough to recover. Chef, you know who didn't really make a lot of additions this year was the Edmonton Oilers bringing in Tobias Reeder and Brodziak and Nico Koskinen. They're not, they're not gonna exactly going to move the needle. Uh, what, I mean, we, I know we're probably more casual observers of what go, is going on out there, but you do have Connor McDavid, who's probably the best player in the league. And you have to wonder how long that situation is going to simmer if they don't do well. Yeah, I mean, what you see there, if you look around at everybody's predictions, they're not, they're not, they're, Six, maybe five, seven. You know, they're they're, they're not expected to finish well. Uh, 
and I don't know is that is that that becomes a bitter situation like like maybe like an Ottawa situation where like I, I want to go somewhere if you're if you're if you're not going to commit to it, you know I want to go somewhere who who knows but yeah I mean I mean for me the biggest surprise like for me this year in the Pacific is San Jose, I mean you know I know Dan is the one that ha- you know has a lot of jerseys but I might have to just put Carlson's name and number on the back of mine that's been just chilling up in my my bedroom for years but uh <laughs> i mean i, I mean it, it's i i look at san jose and i i said oh my gosh i mean this was a team like last year and a year before people were going they're going to be old and useless real fast and you know somehow they got the three top you know three of the top 10 best defensemen in the league and jones there's a lot of uh talk about him possibly you know being a the goalie this year, you know, Vienza. So who knows? I mean, it, 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 the, the Pacific is anything but boring. And I actually like it. The fact that the Flyers are starting out there. Cause I love, I'm a night owl. I love those night games. I'm probably one of the few people, but I do. Yeah. I, I, I don't really care for them, but it's nice once in a while to, it, it, to play. Uh, the style of play is definitely different out there. Uh, Anthony, getting back to you, uh, you just say you just worked on, an article uh, on the Atlantic that, that might be the uh, right. There's just so much competition right now, but that's a very competitive division. And even adding John Tavares, I would still favor Tampa in that division over the Leafs. Well, yeah, the, the, the cool thing about that division, well, for me, I live in Montreal, so like I'm right in the focal point, but um, of that uh, division, but the cool thing about that division is because there's so much diversity because you have, Two teams in Detroit and Ottawa, who will probably be at the bottom, and then you have, uh, then you have Montreal and Buffalo, and potentially Florida, who will be on the bubble there, and then Boston and especially Toronto and Tampa, who are like cup contenders more so than maybe than anyone else in the league. Maybe not Boston, but Toronto and Tampa for sure. But. Uh, yeah, I think as far as cup uh, contenders go, I think Tampa is ahead of Toronto because, you know, Frederick Anderson, he's had two solid seasons in Toronto, but you it's you know, you still don't have a big sample size as far as playoff success goes. And just the defense, I, I don't think that the the Leafs have a defenseman even close to Ryan McDonough or Victor Hedman. You know, Morgan Riley's a nice defenseman as is Jake Gardner, but when you stack up both teams as top four and Toronto rounds it out with Zaitsev and Ron Hainsey as opposed to Anton Strawman and I, whether it be Dan Girardi or Sergachev or Braden Coburn, I just don't see that uh, Toronto even matches up in the slightest in that department at least. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, you know, makes it, it begs a question whether Toronto, if they're really having that kind of season where they look like they could threaten or would they pull the trigger uh, on a trade uh, involving Nylander or somebody like that for a uh, defenseman who maybe is on a team that uh, is kind of rebuilding or what have you, uh, maybe Arizona for OEL. I know uh, that kind of player, I'm not getting specific, but uh, is, yeah, I know you work for, or with the fourth period.com and you have a lot of insiders in, in DB and uh, Dave Panyota. Is there any chatter that, uh, the, the Leafs as an organization would pull the trigger on that kind of deal uh, if, if, if the if situation was right? Well, you know, it, it, they certainly have the pieces to do it, right? You know, Nylander is in the, uh, in the midst of that holdout. But I think for right now, they're going to wait and see because there aren't really any mega defensemen on the roster, I mean, in the NHL who are on the block right now who would warrant such a deal because – if the Leafs are going to part with a guy, let's just say, because he's holding out, like William Nylander, you're going to need someone coming back with just not, like, who's brings that kind of pedigree on the back end, and you're not going to lose out in age. So, what, name me some defensemen who are being shopped around who are under 25 years old and are, like, on the verge of superstardom. I think that if the price is right, they would for sure do it. I know for a fact they were in on Ryan McDonough before he got moved to Tampa at last year's trade deadline. But I guess we'll see. Uh, talks are right now that uh, the Leafs and Nylander are moving towards uh, an agreement, and it looks like it's going to be a two-year bridge deal as opposed to a long-term extension. 
but I'm sure that uh, Kyle Dubas and uh, Brendan Shanahan will have their uh, ears open if a uh, hot commodity on the back end were to come up uh, on the trade front. Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, that, that there's any question they're going to try to do something there to upgrade that if they're having an otherwise uh, really stellar year. Yeah, they don't want to make a haul for Larson trade. I think in the long run, we saw that from Edmonton. Uh, just a, a little note, because Chef referred to what is going on in Edmonton. The good thing and the big difference is that owner out in Edmonton, Cates, is solid. And what would happen, and Anthony, you could back me up on this, that he would blow out people and get a new management team. They're going to do what they can to cater to, to players like McDavid and Dreisaitl, because – you know, those are generational players, at least McDavid is, and Dry Settles a notch or, or a notch and a half below that. Well, yeah, they're going to cater to their superstars, of course, but the, the direction that the Oilers are going down right now, it's kind of tough to watch because, you know, it's kind of like they did two built rebuilds back to back. You had that first wave of Everly and Hall, who have since been traded. And then they struggled with uh, Car McDavid, and they also drafted Leon Dreisaitl two years before that, or the year before that, whichever it was. But uh, I, I just I don't see the leash being long for Peter Chiarelli right now. You know, he botched, like you mentioned, that Hall trade. That Milan Lucic contract is just looking horrible, and the the defense is there's still something left to be desired. You know, you you have. Um, Darnell Nurse and Adam Larson, and but neither of them are poised to be superstars. Same for Oscar Kleffbaum. Is Cam Talbot a starter? I don't know, but I, I really don't see the leash being long for Peter Chiarelli and that management group if it's more of the same in Edmonton. Yeah, yeah, uh, no doubt. Before we leave the Atlantic dis, uh, Division, just uh, Jesperi Kakaniemi, you're in Montreal. I know he's looked good at the exhibition season. Are, are they just taking the nine-game look, or do you think that he definitely uh, is going to be a keeper? I, I think he's going to be a keeper just for the simple fact that he's better than any other centerman uh, that they have on the roster. They had Max Domi playing there before he sucker-punched Aaron Ekblad, <laughs> and he, he's not a centerman. We They did that route with uh, Jonathan Drouin last year from the whole move the, center, uh, move the winger to the center spot, but I, I think Kakaniemi just breathes a breath of fresh air into the Montreal lineup. He's a legit centerman. He's a guy that has a high ceiling. And who who's better on their roster? Their other three centermen on opening night are going to be uh, Phil Deneau, Michael Pekka, or Matthew Pekka, sorry. <laughs> I bet they wish it was Michael yeah, Pekka. Yeah, they wish it was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Tomish Plakanik. And you tell me if Dano Plakanik or Pekka are even close to a top line center. But, you know, the Habs are now, they're, they're, they're accepting this rebuild now, or as Bergevin will say, a retool, if you will. So now it's okay to have a first line where an 18 year old is your first line center, because there are no more expectations. Pacioretty is gone. Galchenyuk is gone. So I think that now this will be a full season thing. And I think the Habs are just kind of all in with this youth movement. Yeah. Yeah. I I just hope they don't, uh, you know, take a little bit off, off of his development, but thank God the Flyers are not in such a desperate straits. I think Bergevin is just, you know, it's trying to be Popeye with these big forearms you know, for working the phones. His forearms are just blowing up. It's between that <laughs> and the spinach. Uh, Dan, just, one team I think is could catch people sleeping is the Florida Panthers. They had Mike Hoffman, uh, Radham Verbata, who just retired today. Good luck, Radham. And I think, boy, they're, they're really stacked when you look at their forward lines. And if uh, Ekblad can kind of return to his rookie form, all they need is competent goaltending. And I'll tell you, if the Flyers don't make the playoffs, the Panthers could be one of those teams that steps right in. Yeah, this is a team that 
really has kind of gotten really good under the radar. Uh, you know, they pushed last season to get into the playoffs, but just uh, were a couple games short towards the end uh, after a midseason slump. But, you know, they went out and they picked up Mike Hoffman. Uh, they have Barkov and Huberto and Boostad and uh, Trocek and uh, Dadunov. They have got a lot of firepower. And, you know, Keith Yandel uh, is starting to get a little older. He's 32. Uh, Aaron Ekblad, you know, they're really expecting a lot out of him. Hopefully he can uh, come back. Uh, but, you know, their depth isn't the best on defense, and their goaltending is not looking good. I mean, Roberto Luongo is 39. I believe he turns 40 uh, in early spring. I don't have that in front of me. But, you know, I think they could certainly push uh, – for a playoff spot this year, I think it's going to be a tough one in the Atlantic, but I think the wild card race is going to be a little more open. So they could definitely uh, sneak in this year. Yeah, I, I think that's an anticipation of a possible injury or a decrease in performance from um, Luongo. The smartly, and I'm hoping the GM of the Flyers has noticed, they go out, they have James Reimer, who's not really good enough. But they get Michael Hutchinson from the Winnipeg Jets and to just to cover themselves. He might be a Band-Aid, but a Band-Aid at the right time and the right place can be a lifesaver. Hint, hint. But we move to the Central Division, Chef. Winnipeg has all the, uh, the looks of a team that's on the precipice of a breakthrough, a Stanley Cup window that probably started last year, got their experience. They got last year what they had 114 points. I don't see them going backward. They lose Stasny, I understand, but they have so much internal growth capability. Well, what 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 do you see with the, the Winnipeg Jets and that lineup? Oh, I I think they're gonna comp- they're gonna compete again. I, I think they're gonna be they're gonna be really good. Uh, you know, sad to say. Uh, I mean for other everybody else in their division uh looking at it now and you know i i mean do i know enough of them now probably not i really don't get you don't get to see much of them uh you know when i'm watching anyway but they they do have they do have pieces that they can put everything together and make a good good run i mean there i have them up there in finishing right right up at the conference with san jose I think that that's how good they can be. Yeah, yeah there's no doubt. It's, and they're going to battle that with Nashville. I'm starting to wonder whether if this is Nashville's like last year before they have to do a little bit of a retool. I'm not really sure about that. Uh, Anthony, I think St. Louis is kind of like a pretender to the throne. They filled in some spots, but I don't think the quality – through, it's just not there, I don't think, through that lineup. And we just don't know what we're going to get in goal from Jake Allen. Well, yeah, um, I, I think the Blues have made a had a really good offseason. And, you know, they added Ryan O'Reilly and Patrick Maroon and Tyler Bozak. But, yeah, it all comes down to Jake Allen. He really is as in- inconsistent as they come. Uh, I, I really like the Blues, especially on the back end. I think Alex Pietrangelo is a top five defenseman in the NHL. But like it kind of was back four years ago or so when they made that move to acquire Ryan Miller when the, when it was TJ Oshie and David Backus and that right. whole clan, yeah. the, the stars kind of lined up for them when L.A. and Chicago were at their peak. And they weren't quite there. And to the point you just mentioned, I think they're trying to do it again now where you have four teams ahead of them in San Jose, Vegas, Nashville, and uh, Winnipeg. I feel like St. Louis is a bubble team, but not as far as the bubble for the playoffs are concerned, but a bubble from just an everyday playoff team to a true contender. Because I would put St. Louis above perhaps uh, the Los Angeles Kings and the Calgary Flames and the Dallas Stars, but I just can't put them up top with Vegas and San Jose, Nashville, and Winnipeg. No, I think it would be an upset. I think it would take a superior breakthrough year from uh, Jake Allen, really, to to do something. And we're going to go through the Metro division, and then we're going to – let's do a quick yes or no. 
Are the Dan are the Flyers going to make the playoffs? Yes or no? Yes. Jeff. Yes. Anthony. Yes. Okay, I agree. I think they're going to make it somehow, some way. Now, Kevin Allen from USA Today has picked the Flyers to finish in second place in the Metro. And of course, it's really trusting the goaltending, which to me will make or break the Flyers this year. Where do we have them? Anthony, let me start with you. Where do you think they're going to finish? Well, I think that there's no reason why they shouldn't finish inside the top three. I think that anything outside the top three, in my opinion, should be considered a failure by the organization. Because, sure, you have Pittsburgh and you have Washington, but they're as good as Columbus, and I expect Columbus to be a train wreck this year, given all of what's going on surrounding Artemi Panarin and Sergei Bobrovsky. The New Jersey Devils, I wouldn't be surprised if they set back a bit. But even if they do make the playoffs, they shouldn't be anything more than a bubble team. And then after that, the Flyers are way better than the Canes and uh, the two New York teams. So I I think that they could easily finish ahead of Washington. But at minimum, they should be in third place. As you mentioned, it's going to come down to the goaltending. But they have a good enough roster that – mediocre goaltending and just average goaltending should get them no less than third in the division. Yeah. Uh, I'm picking the Flyers uh, third in the division. I still think some combination of Washington, Pittsburgh, or Columbus will finish ahead of them. I do think Columbus has some issues, not only with the two pending free agents in Panarin and, and Bobrovsky, but also with the Steph Jones injury. That's a, a, a big issue for them. So, and Ryan Murray. And Ryan, well, yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'm going to be counting a lot on Zach Wierenski and a lot of spirit. And if they get buried early in the year, like I said earlier, it's going to be tough to dig, dig themselves out. Dan, what, what's, your, what's your finish for the Flyers in the Metro? You know, I think the Metro division, maybe one of the more interesting divisions in the league, simply because there's so many teams that are – maybe not evenly matched, but could all make a you know, We had our friend uh, Jamie Basco on last week, and he and I were discussing the division. And, you know, I think you can pretty much count out the Islanders, and that's about it. You know, the Rangers have gone through a rebuild, but they still – I think they're still good enough to at least pose a threat. Same thing for Carolina where they could, you know, maybe hang around. They did push for a spot last year, but, you know, had a really bad start, so they didn't, didn't quite make the playoffs. But, you know, I think it – fair to look at teams like Columbus and New Jersey they may not be ready to go full out but neither are the Flyers so I think the while the Flyers are ahead of them they're not by much and I think Pittsburgh and Capitals are probably going to be uh, a combination of one or two I think it the Flyers should hopefully make the top three I think they're I, I would expect the top three I don't know if they would finish number two uh, they did uh, get close to Pittsburgh last year towards the end of the year but uh, the Flyers sank towards the end and, and ended up in third. So I think I think the Flyers make the playoffs. I don't know what the rest of the division is going to look like. I think you can count on Pittsburgh and Washington to be there. But outside of that, I don't really know uh, what else to expect. There's a lot of interesting questions in the division. Before we get to a couple of those and close it out, Chef, well, what are your impressions about the Flyers and where they're going to finish in the Metro? I kind of agree with Dan. I mean, like if if you look down, uh, the Hurricanes could be a, a the spoiler, or so could the Rangers. But uh, I, personally, I think that they're going to win. The Flyers are going to win in spite of the goaltending. I think that they might have enough power firepower this year uh, for scoring to, to like overcome a little bit of you know those what we've seen in the past is, you know, let down goals that come in and where the takes the wind out of your sails. I, I, I think they, they just shake it off this year. I think they come back and they score goals. I have them second. I have, you know, uh, Penguins ahead of them and the Capitals one game behind them. So it, it's a tight top three, but I have them finishing one, two, and three like that. Okay. I have the Flyers uh, finishing third with 101 points this year. It's not going to sound – it doesn't sound over 98 points to be that much of an improvement. But I think if you look at where they play, they'll be a lot better and a lot more on the right side of the puck, and which will portend 
for a better playoff performance. I still don't think they're going to win a round, however, because that goaltending, it really bothers me. Now, if by some miracle, Carter Hart is fantastic, it just blows it up in the AHL, and they bring him up and we have a Patrick Waugh situation, well, then all bets are off and we're we're in for something magical. But uh, Anthony, what is ultimately the destination of this team this year? I think it's tough, you know, because you look at the defense, you look at the forwards, and you think, you know what, this team should be able to win around. But as you just mentioned, it's um, it's a it's the goaltending that really holds it back. If I'll put it this way, if we look at the same roster, barring any minor additions or subtractions, I think it's a first round playoff uh, playoff round exit, much like last year. But if they were to make a deadline deal to acquire, let's say, like a big time forward or top four defenseman or one of the goalies catches lightning in a bottle, uh, I think they could win a round. But to imagine them past the second round, let alone the first round, I think would be a stretch. So I think they may may get into the second round this year. But besides that, I think it's going to be more of the same like last year. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's... Uh... I think that's where they're at right now. And and there's so many storylines when you have young players and young players on the brink that aren't even on the team, that's, that can just point you in such a different direction. And that's, what's really interesting. And, and gentlemen, keep in mind, we can have a goaltending situation like Carolina, where I don't know if I've heard the latest about, and Anthony, maybe, you know, the latest on Scott Darling, if there's ever a team that should be reaching out for a goaltender, it's the Carolina Hurricanes. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Darling did them no favors last year. He was absolutely atrocious. As we know, he, they, they got Mrazic, but uh, maybe <laughs> they put it. Talk about atrocious. Well, well there there we go. So I, I, I don't know where, where they stand. That, that front office has been completely overhauled over the last calendar year, starting from the, the top all the way down to the coaching staff. But uh I don't know. Uh, I don't know where they're going to find it. I know Curtis McElhaney went on waivers today, but uh, goalies are hard to come by in this league, as we all know in Philadelphia. So uh, I don't know, Carolina, um, they're saddled with Darling for another three years. I know they kind of tried to take the Cam Talbot uh, route, you know, go after a promising backup, but it's not looking too good right now. No, no. And earlier before you got on, I made a case that the Flyers should sign uh, pick up uh, Curtis McElhenney for a 20-30 game coverage to, to get through these injuries and find out what is what, uh, because I think they're just, they're skiing without ski poles right now, and it's going downhill rapidly, and I think they're uh, really, it's a slip shot if they don't do something, because there's too many injured guys, and not a, that's a situation that uh, bears watching, that's for sure. Well, I think it's that time of night where gentlemen, Chef, why don't we just go with who you think is going to be in the Stanley Cup Finals and pick a winner? I think I, I tipped my card already earlier, didn't I? Yes, I you did, but just to make it official. A, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's definitely going to be San Jose, and I think they win. Uh, San Jose. And, oh, I'm sorry. San Jose and uh, – God, I forget. When did I write it down? No, I have San, I have San Jose winning. Okay. And against some ghost opponent. So, oh, <laughs> yeah. Ghost opponent. We'll say that for now. Okay. Good uh, enough. Uh, Dan, what, what, what do you, uh, what do you got? I'm going to go with uh, Vegas and Tampa Bay and Vegas is going to win. Okay. Uh, Anthony. Yeah. You, you have to make all these write-ups. So this is probably right, right down your alley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually got my email um, today uh, from uh, Dennis, uh, sorry, from David for it. Uh, But, um, you know, it was tough because there's just so many options. But I have uh, Toronto against San Jose, and I have San Jose winning. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go with Tampa Bay versus Winnipeg. And I think that the Winnipeg Jets are going to win the Stanley Cup after they make some kind of trade to fill in that that third-line center hole. 
and that's what I'm thinking. You know, I would usually agree with you, but they got rid of the greatest goaltender of all time, Steve Mason, this summer, so I don't uh, think they're going to win. Yeah, you got a point there. They've been the hell of, <laughs> they've been the hell and back with Hellebuck, but no, I think uh, that's a hell of a squad they got there. Steve Mason's unemployed because he was a locker room lawyer. Otherwise, uh, he'd be here probably. Who knows? But uh, I think that that uh, that train has left the station, as, as I said last week. And with that, uh, we have done it all. We've covered it all for you. I'm sure I forgot about 10 things that are going on, but we're going to call it a night. Anthony, you write for the fourth dot com. Uh, where can people contact you on Twitter? Well, my handle is at a demarco twenty five. You can also find my work at the fourth period's handle at TFP. I also suggest all my colleagues and Hannah Spraker, Dennis Bernstein, David Pagnota, and uh, you could just check out the website, the fourth period dot com. Absolutely, and this Saturday will be the first show of the fourth period on Sirius XM uh, Radio. Yeah, yeah, uh, off the rush. Uh, off the rush. Season. Off the rush. Yeah. Uh, well, is, uh, pardon me. No, I was going to say essentially that's the fourth period radio radio show, really. Yeah, the fourth period plus uh, Nick Alberga and Nick's a great addition, and um, uh, Dennis and uh, David will be broadcasting from uh, Montreal in two weeks' time, and uh, on that show, I will most likely be making my uh, debut for the season on it. Ah, but I would great. suggest everyone to uh, tune in every Saturday to hear those three. They do a great job. Right. That's 11, 11 a.m. Eastern time, is that? 11 a.m. Eastern time, and it takes you till 1. Yeah, excellent. It's, it's such an enjoyable show. The guys have great rapport, and you're right. Nick Alberger is terrific. Anthony, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Chef, any final thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to go with <laughs> – I should have said Toronto, but now it looks like I'm copying off Anthony. I brain farted. I couldn't – but, oh, uh, I can't wait for Flyers hockey to start. I'm looking forward to it, and and I just want to get it started already. Yeah, yeah, we're all looking forward to Thursday night. Dan, final word. Yeah, a uh, couple days away. Let's hope they don't suck. And uh, <laughs> by the way, to, to my uh, co-writer, I uh, butchered his name last week. John Gove is his name, at John P. Gove on Twitter. So feel free to follow him. I know I uh, horribly mispronounced his name last week, but I got it right this week. Yeah, and of course, both of you write for phillyisflyer.com. That's right. Okay, and I, I had my own name for uh, John. Uh, I called him Rico Gove, but it's an old joke from a song from probably about 25 years ago now. Nobody gets it. <laughs> but anyway, with that, the OMB podcast episode number 30 is wrapping up. We're on five uh, podcast platforms and – also on YouTube channel of the Philly Sports Network. Our sponsors here, and we really appreciate if you rate and subscribe, particularly with iTunes. It, it's a big deal. We really appreciate it. And everybody, let's look forward to Thursday. Let's go, Flyers. And with that, the OMB podcast says good night and take care.